Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and this is the final of four videos in this series where I'm updating an app that I created in a previous series to use iOS 15 features. In this video, we'll be improving our app finally one more time to give our users the ability to filter the list based on some search or filter criteria. Now, before I get started, let me request that if you enjoy the video, please leave a comment below and give it a thumbs up subscribe to my channel. Make sure you ring the bell to be notified of new videos, and if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. If this is something you want to learn, then keep watching. Now, as this is a continuation from the previous videos, you should just be using the code that you would have completed after that final last video. However, I've also included the completed part for part three here, so you can download it from the link in the description below. Now, another great feature of iOS 15 is the ability to add a search field to your Swift UI view, and that will allow you to filter a list based on the criteria provided. And this is done by adding a searchable method to the list, passing in a placeholder, and binding it to some string property that we'll be able to use as a search criteria. But before I show you filtering, I want to fix a bug that I discovered in the last video. When I run and tap to edit, the keyboard shows me that the dismiss keyboard button was created. However, when I created a new item, that toolbar wasn't displayed. And the reason is that I need to attach the toolbar group to the list, and I've not done that. So I'm going to return to content view and cut out that toolbar from the end and paste it right before we set the navigation bar items. Let's test again. First, delete that blank one. Now, if we tap on an existing one, we see the toolbar. If we create a new item and tap in, I now see that it's here too. Perfect. Well, now I'm ready to start filtering. And the first thing I'm going to do is go to my view models data store and add a new publish property called filter text. And I'm going to initialize it as an empty string, meaning no filters. Back in content view, I can add that new searchable method to my list view and I'll bind it to my data store's filter text. And let's put this right below our alert. Now I'll accept the default placement so I can remove this. And for the prompt, I can use the text filter to do's. If we run our app now, we immediately see that we have a search bar above the list. And when we tap on it, the navigation bar collapses and we're allowed to enter our filter criteria. What we have to do now, though, is to code how to filter our list. Well, the challenge we have is that once our list is filtered, we still want to be able to edit and add or delete more to-dos. So we can't use a computed property to display the filtered array. We're going to have to create a duplicate array that is used for presenting the data, but make sure that any updates are made to the original array as well. So, back in data store, let's create a new property called filter to dos. That's an array of to do, and we'll initialize it as an empty array. And then, when we load our to dos, we'll also assign the same to dos to our filtered to dos array. And this is done on the load to dos throws function, so make sure you don't add it to the old completion handler version. With that in place then, back in content view, instead of looping over the to-dos, we'll loop over the filtered to-dos instead. So what do we want to happen when someone enters text into our search field? Well, if the string isn't empty, we want to filter the filtered to-dos list for any of the to-do names that contain the entered string. 
and we should probably ignore the case so that we can convert both the name and entered strings to lowercase before comparing. So to do this, we can evaluate every time filter text is changed with a property observer, a did set property observer. So if not filter text is empty, then filter to do's is going to be equal to our to do's filtered where zero dot name lowercase contains the filter text lowercase. If it is empty, we'll just return the to do's array, the original one. If we run our app now and tap on the filter field, we'll see that the filtering takes place as expected. As I tap into the field, I can start typing to filter on tasks. And my list is reduced to these two items here. Let's try to edit one of the items. Great, that works too. But what if I try to delete one? It doesn't look like it's gotten deleted. Remember, I was trying to delete this grocery eggs item. Well, let me exit the app and run again. Hmm, seems that I actually did delete. And the edit was saved too. Well, what if I try to add one? That doesn't seem to work here either. However, again, if I rerun the app, I see that indeed I have an empty to do, so it must have been added. Well, that's because we're not refreshing our filter to do's list after we add or delete, and we need to do that. Unfortunately, that's really very easy to do. Since we only add when we're displaying all of the to do's, when I create a new to do, I can reset filter to do's to the new to do's array that's been updated. Let's test this. When I tap on the button, a new row gets added. Let's add back that grocery eggs item. And then I'll tap return to confirm. If we exit, and relaunch, we see that it persisted. Perfect. Okay, we still need to work on that delete to do because it wasn't working at all. For delete to do, we can do the same thing after we remove the to do, but because we may be in the middle of a filter, we should probably refilter again. We could just copy and paste the code from our did set property observer but it's not a good idea to repeat ourselves. So I'm going to create a private function called filter to do's. So I'll copy the text from our property observer and paste that into the body of our function. And then I can replace our property observer with a call to that function. And then where we delete our to do after we remove it from the to do's array, we can call that filter function. Well, now we can test once more. Let's edit a to-do. Let's make one completed by swiping from the leading edge. And let's add a new one for groceries. And we'll specify bread. And finally, let's delete the eggs grocery item. Let's test by rerunning the app. Yes, that's working. Now there's one final thing that I want to do here, and that's to modularize our code a bit. This item that we're iterating through on our list can go into a separate view struct or something like that, and eventually into its own file. If I bring back the preview, I can option shift click on the for each loop and choose to extract a subview. The problem with this is that it uses a data store and a focus field, and I don't want to have to include an environment object for the data store. 
nor a binding to this focus field, which may become problematic to do as it's a different type of property wrapper than we've seen before. So instead, I'm going to cut out this for each loop and within the content view, create a new computed property that I'll just call list row. And it will be of type sum view. And I'll paste that for each loop in there. I don't need to add any properties at all because I'm still part of that view. And then back in my list, I can simply enter that computed variable list row. If we test now, we see that it works. We're able to display our list. So one last thing then, let's move this into its own file. So I'm going to cut the computed property from content view, but I need to create a new file that will use an extension of content view. So we'll call it content view plus extension. And I'll change the import to Swift UI. Then I can start by creating an extension to content view and paste the code into that extension. Now, if I build this, I get an error saying that focus field is inaccessible due to the private protection level. And this is because we moved that computed property to its own file and it wants access to where it was declared, which is in the original content view, and it was marked as private. So we'll have to remove that designation. If we run once more, we'll see that our list of to-dos displays just fine. Well, that's it. We've successfully updated our app, but now it's available only on iOS 15. I did another series earlier where I created an iOS 14 app and then conditionally updated it to run under iOS 15 so that it would still run under both OS versions. And I'll leave a link to this in the notes below. In this new app, however, it's not conditional. You'll have to be running this on a device that has been upgraded to iOS 15 or later because we've used modifiers and new functionality that is entirely dependent on the iOS 15 APIs. If you've enjoyed this series, please make sure that you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And if you're so inclined, you can support my work by buying me a coffee. Thanks so much for watching.